Hey guys, part two of today's lecture. So um, let's continue where we stopped. So last thing we were talking about, we talked about epigraphy. We talked about um, the guys who came late, make sure to watch the first part because you missed out some stuff like about incremental innovation and equalization. So this is the first part of the video. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about functional decomposition. So well, I, it's a quick tool. I'm trying to kind of pinpoint some useful techniques that you actually need to know about. So when we talk about, now we are at stage, we have the idea. We're gonna make, um, again, a desk that opens based on biometrics. We have it. Now we do something called functional decomposition. So what are the functionalities? Functions, you know? If anybody has any engineering, computer engineering, maybe electrical engineering background, you know what I'm talking about. So we have two kinds of functional decomposition. Uh, one is called hierarchical, so it's hierarchy. So I want function one. Um, allow the desk to open horizontally and vertically. Under that, you have A1.1. Allow the desk to um, open with an angle of 40 degrees. You know, you see, we're zooming inside like divide and conquer. You have a big function. Within its sub functions. Exactly. It's like a WBS and a project management, but maybe in a more technical way. That's called hierarchical. So I start with functions and, and have sub functions. And when I want to do it, I could either do top down, top down, or bottom up, typically bottom up. Meaning I do the small functions. So if I have a big function that has five functions, I do all five functions. I do the big function. Okay, does that make sense? That's called hierarchy, uh, one kind of decomposition. The other kind of decomposition is black box. So it's not a hierarchy, it's input output. I have a box, I have signals coming in, whatever th these things are coming in, I wanna know what's coming out. We call this black box and I don't care what's inside this black box, I care about two things. What's my input, what's my output, typically many inputs and many outputs. Once I know this, I go inside the black box, inside that box, and figure out how can I take these inputs and give these outputs, I start subdividing it. Yes, yeah, the output could be uh, a rotational device, a motor or something. Okay, so these are two kind, major kinds of decomposition. Let me talk about them quick. So why do you need functional decomposition? Obviously, we usually sit with the customers a lot, trying to understand what they want. And every one of the things they want, they're called functions. I want it to be uh, to be blue. You know, it's not a function, this is a constraint. So it's a constraint of color. So you have two things, you have constraints and you have um, uh, functions. So if you look at constraints, that's another thing. Um, uh, so I'll talk about this as an example, this robot as an example in a second. So we want to, for example, provide heat, detect crash, stop uh, vehicles. All these are examples of functional analysis. So what are the things we need in terms of functionality? Typically, a function is a verb followed by a noun. You know, like a job to be done, we had before. So I got detect crash verb followed by a noun. This is how usually a functionality is written. Uh, we usually design them in two different ways. So we need to focus on what the system needs to do. That's number one, this is what in terms of functionality. What are the operations that will affect performance? And finally, if we have any actions to take, okay? So this is what a typical function is. The other part, we have the form, right? So every device that we have has two things. What it does and how it looks like. That's the form. The car, the Lamborghini. The functionality of a Lamborghini is what? Take me from one place to another, right? Yeah. That's not that function. But the form is where all the innovation is. You know, maybe the functionality, ah, you want to go from zero to 700 in, I don't know, three seconds, okay? So yeah, that's the functionality more technical, but the form is very important there. So the so form and function come hand to hand. Obviously the form is the shape, the design, the components, the physical components as well. Usually you have to state all the functionalities and decompose them. So what you need to remember, if you want to remember anything from everything I just talked about for the last 10 minutes, is I have two major kinds of functional decomposition. Okay, which are, and you just go ahead and, and, and again, as I said, we have also constraints, typically constraints would be in terms of cost, size, mass, reliability, all these are constraints, you know? It cannot be more than 50 kilograms. It's not a function, it's a constraint, you know? So you can put constraints, 
and I have the functions. The first kind, as I said, of decomposition is hierarchy, you know, starting with a big function. Within it, you have sub functions. And when I want to solve it, I solve it typically bottom up. You know, I start with the small functions and end up doing the bigger function. We usually generate a functional tree. You know, it's like a tree, it's a like graph. You know, function has children, these would be the sub functions. Okay, the other kind is called the black box. Again, this is useful to do functional decomposition. Typically, as I said, the product or what you're doing is abstract, is modeled as an abstract device, it's black box. All it cares about is what are the inputs and what are the outputs. Typically, you have the inputs, I'll talk about it in a second, um, like material, energy, information coming in. Right? Again, the, from the, the desk, the input is the fingerprints, the biometric device, the energy, the battery, all these are coming in. The output is something happening, you know, actuation. Okay? A quick example, I'm not going to go too much time on the example. Again, this is an SCMO robot, if you don't know it, kind of famous. Okay, so again, when they designed it, this is actual specs. Did not come up with this. They did a functional decomposition, let me give you an example. Um, obey a human master. That's the first function. Obey a human master. Uh, recognize and identify humans. And so let me just show you the sub functions. Walk over even, uneven level and sloped surfaces, ascend and descend. That was a function. Within that function, what do we have? Sub function, that's the hierarchy. Under this, I want to walk, okay? Stand upright and maintain posture. Again, support its own weight. All these were sub-functions that would lead to this bigger function. So for me to solve this function, I have to solve all these sub-functions, avoid obstacles and so on. Does that make sense? And if you read the documentation, it keeps on going and going. And within the sub-functions, so layer one, layer two, you have other functions, avoid obstacles, avoid obstacles, should I mean? What does it mean? Sense, presence, and proximity of obstacles, I want to sense them. Uh, maneuver around the obstacles. These two would allow me to avoid obstacles. All these would allow me to walk over even surface. Does that make sense? This is what we call a hierarchical functional decomposition. So again, in your final project, highly recommend it to have a decomposition of what are the functions of your uh, device, whatever device or prototype. Does that make sense? It would be able to do this, this. For this, I need to do this. So what are the functions? And I can keep on going. Again, I show you a snippet here. You see here, handle objects, uh, grasp, hold, carry, place, push, and uh, determine status, and so on. Okay. Yes. Typically, it's a, typically it's an appendix, and this is what programmers will take and start. They don't talk to you. They will take your functional decomposition. You don't have to be a computer scientist to do these, right? You have to be a computer guy to do these? Of course not. If you design, if you invented this robot, you could put these, but do you know how to do them? Maybe you don't. But this is the specs. Now you can give it to him, say, do it for me in a month. He will go through these one by one and do everything. He gives it back to you, say, I'm done. You told me these, these are the, you know, it's kind of a, a, as I said, specs, specifications of your innovation. Okay, they're more technical. Uh, unlike before, there were attributes. I wanted to do this. I wanted to fly. You know what does fly mean? Functionally, you have to explain what fly. It's like divide and conquer. A big function becomes smaller, and so on. This is called hierarchical functional decomposition. The other kind is um, the black box. This is the other example. Again, from I take it from this paper. So black box, uh, again, decomposition, same thing, but we don't compose them to functions. As I said, we care about what are the inputs, what are the outputs. In this example, it's a handheld nailer. You want a handheld nailer, you want to put a nail. You don't do like this, you know, like a gun that put nails. Okay, so what does it want? So we have some assumptions. The nailer will use nails, okay, as opposed to adhesives. Usually, sometimes you use adhesives. The nail, they, they will be compatible with nail magazines and existing tools. The nailer will nail um, will nail into wood. The nailer will be handheld and so on. You have all these. Anyways, let me just fast forward a bit. So this is what a black box would look like. Unlike the other one, I use the assumptions. Again, typically I have inputs. So what kind of energy I have to put in the nailer? What material it's taking? Typically it's nails. What signal? 
you know, in this case, it's a tool that I'm using, like, a, look, you know, this like a gun style, maybe. Um, again, what is getting out, the driven nail on the wall, uh, what signal is getting out, what energy. So you can see the design is more abstract. You see, there's no lot of details. Now I can zoom in to the box inside, and I can decide how it's going to work. You make smaller boxes, you see, small abstracts inside. Um, again, store, accept energy, convert the energy into some kind of other energy because, right? Because you could put, let's say you're putting battery. And I do this, it, it put it in, right? The nail to be in the wall, you need energy, right? I mean, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And this kind of energy is what we call translational energy, okay? So to allow it to kind of go through the wall. And so, and so I'm not gonna go to the physics part, but you see the logic, right? This compared to the one before this, the first kind was more systematic, Functions, subfunctions, sub subfunctions in a hierarchy way. Second one, though, it's boxes and it's basically a bunch of nail box, uh, black black boxes uh, until we get from input to output. Okay, so this is an example of what we're looking at the form of the product that we just showed you. Okay, so two kinds of functional decomposition. So we talk about form again. Form function. The form is how it looks like. So it's actually the design of it. Some people care about form a lot. Typically, form follows function, typically. But as we said in our days, form and function coexist. They go together. It's not one follows the other. Okay? Um, again, we usually use drawings, 3D models, and so on to actually get the idea of the form. Um, and when you look at the form, this is very important to pay attention. So you have the concept. It's kind of the concept of what we're trying to do. It's a vision. We're looking at function to form. This is very nice. So form is not like if I want a chair um, um, that allows us to, I don't know, to do like this, for example. So when I draw it, I'm not gonna draw it like this, right? I'm gonna draw it like this. Because you are trying to tell a story that this is allowing you to do this. So you're gonna put some, some kind of arrow to explain that purpose of this specific thing. So this is where the concept comes handy. So what's the concept you're trying to do? Typically very abstract but must allow the execution of all the functionalities as much as it can, that specific functionality, and how it has all the working principles in it. So if, for example, this is a concept, a sketch of a mechanical design. Let me just show you a better example. So this is the three, yeah, these are the three, I don't know why I have it in green here, but that's fine. So you have the function, you have the four, the concept, and the four. Let me show you, you can see it here, for example, um, Provide meeting place with visible main speaker and processions, right? You can see it? So you can see this small example of a concept. I did not do it, right? It's just showing you it's a meeting area and it's visible. You know, it's kind of visible. Let's see the other one. Provide meeting place with large main class. Okay, you can see this kind of an arrow provide this largeness into it, right? If I did like small lines, it would not, but if you look at it, intuitively it looks large. Yeah. It's a concept. And this is the real thing, by the way, you can see it, the podium, you know, this is the actual form of it. This is the concept of the form. Does that make sense? Again, as you can see the meeting, uh, provide meeting place with each uh, participant visible to others. You can see it, uh, each participant is visible. This is what you were focusing on. Again, the function that I was looking for in this concept was they can see each other. You know, does that make sense? So a typical exam question, where I give you a concept, tell you what was the function. Or I give you a function, say draw a concept, you know? So I wanna see, if, are you comfortable with this? Does that make sense? Are we cool? In terms of concept, form, and function. So again, typically, as I said, form follows function, but typically in these days, they are coming together, and sometimes even form before function. Okay? So are we good with this whole concept uh, form thing? Yeah, we're fine? Can I move on? Yes? Okay, so if you look at issues during the life cycle of the product, so we talked about the form, the design, the function, so the, the products have life cycle, like Omar Tawil Alkun, you have hopefully a long life, we have an expiration date, right? That one day, put our hands and we die, right? Products also die, you know? And this is what we call a life cycle. We have a time where you get a peak, you go down, you go up, you know, you notice? So typically, they go through four phases, any product, typically. We always say typically because you have exceptions. 
but typically they go through four phases. Very important, pay attention. Phase one, obviously, as you can see, is introduction. Introduction, not like introduction paragraph. Introduction to the public. We introduce this new product, right? So you have the introduction. We are here. We have R&D. It's very important at this stage. Research and development. Still new. Still introducing it. And now it goes up. Now we grow. We're growing, right? The typical product is growing, the growth. So at this stage, again, we're looking at the quality of what we're doing because we're growing, we want to make it better. We just introduced, uh, I don't know, uh, Walkman, you know, or MP3 player. We introduced it to the public, we're here. Now we have to focus on the quality of it. How many megabytes, what kind of quality, DVR, you know, I wanted to do. So we're going up here. Now we mature, maturity level. When you get to maturity, this is where it comes. Kind of, it's looking bad, you know, typically you mature, you either stay there, and the odds are so difficult to stay there. Uh, it depends how long you're going to stay there, until you start declining, right? So that's the last phase is decline. So maturity level, obviously, competition start coming. You mature enough, but competition try to compete with you, you know. Um, again, you cannot change a lot of quality here. It's too late, you know, you're mature. You're kind of an old lady, you know, you're an old man. So if you want to do some surgeries, you know, some plastic surgery maybe, but 90% will not work. But if you want to grow, you grow. This is where you grow and you stick here, okay? Grow so, yeah? You can't grow again. No, that, then you have to go back here and introduce something new, you know? Unless it's incremental, back to the incremental innovation, as I said, like Gmail. So it's mature, Gmail is mature, but still goes up like this, you know? It's kind of fluctuating here. Was up and down, up and down, all in this stage. But yes, so when typically a life cycle is like that. I say always say typically. Doesn't mean this is a stance. And sometimes it peaks, right? Sometimes as soon as you introduce it, it goes up. It stays there, right? I want to show you some 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 graphs now with other graphs. So typically a life cycle goes through four stages. Now in terms of innovation, and, and part of this is a cool concept called value engineering. If you've heard of VE before, very hot topic. The idea of value engineering is. We want to reduce complexity, we want to reduce the cost by removing redundancies, removing junk, removing things that I could live without, which would lead to reduce of cost but higher functionality. That's what value engineering is. Okay? So I improve the design, I improve safety, I improve maintainability. Yep. Exactly. It's all about optimization. So if I'm doing A, B, C, D, how can I do it in E or F that combines A, B, C together? Saved human resources, saved you know, labor and stuff. That's what we call value engineering. So we focus on the value rather than on what the product does, okay? So if you look at this really quick example, this is a nice example. I mean, it's simple, but you can see this cost me $3.5. You can see the mechanics here. If anybody has some background, but you know, you have many, many components, right? Forget about what this does, right? Suppose it does something. Now look at it, we made it two bucks. Why? Look at this, we removed this, right? We moved it and still kind of does the, the same thing to an extent, so we don't have this joint anymore that was here, right? Now, in version three, we made it even cheaper. Look at this now compared to the first version, right? See, most of the components are removed, typically doing the same job. That's what we call value engineering. It's kind of unifying components, removing redundancy, and typically increasing uh, maintainability and um, uh, performance, okay? So it's all about, as you said, optimizing the resources that we have. Either physical resources, as you can see, or even human resources. You know, how can I optimize this? That's what they call value engineering. And this is part of the life cycle of any product. Yes? On the maturity level of the product, what should the company do? Keep the product No, it does incremental. It, it, no, it will remain mature as much as it can. To be, to be there, because many people start coming, right? Because you you grow, and oh, wow, this is a good idea. What you want to do like you. You want to make sure that you uh, have a barrier to entry. So you want to be stay mature, you know? Right? Because you, you don't see anybody who is mature and becomes immature. You want to stay there until your days are gone, right? Like many technologies, right? Go back to the history. CD-ROMs, where are they today? You know, where are CD-ROMs? Floppy disks. If you want to talk about technology, walkmans, you know, um, TVs, you know, normal TV, and so on, uh, Ataris, and so on. A lot of them grew, stable, mature, died, you know? And sometimes you have disruptive innovation between coming, the things we talk about. Things that disrupt the whole thing. 
some people die quickly, some products die quickly, and some people die quickly, ironically enough, it's, there is an analogy, okay? So let's look at this, this is a very good concept. So the question is, when do I go to market? If you go back to our innovation that we taught you, because we're ending this course, right? We have about one hour more to go. The last phase was go to market, right? We did all this, now we all go to market. When do I go to market? This is the big question, it's very challenging, right? You wanna bring your product to the market at just the right time. Just the right time, not too early, not too late, right? So the question is when, you know, it's so difficult. Not too early, not too late. So you can see too early is here, too late is here. You wanna just, just try it when you go to the market. So but the question is when, when is just right, you know? That's a very, very nice question. A lot of people have done tons of research on this, okay? So I'll give you an example, I'll give you an example. But you would always, a lot of you would think too early is good, right? Because you're the first one. Yeah. You know, oh, we did it. Ironically enough, it's not. And I'll give you some examples. Anybody have heard of Zoom? Yeah. Oh, wow, has somebody have heard of Zoom? Yeah. I've taught yeah. this course for quite a bit. Never told, nobody, nobody told me he's heard of it. Huh? Yeah, yeah, but you've heard of it? It's a private. Okay, let's see about the others. You've heard of Zoom? Okay. Zoom was before the iPod. You see? I mean, typically, it's one of one of the first... Yeah, before that, we have another version of the Microsoft version. But the idea is not haven't heard of it too much, right? So, here, there is a nice example of the Diamond Rio, first of all. 1998, right? Excellent, you haven't heard of it, right? You've heard of the Zoom? So what do you think I'm trying to show you here, obviously? Too early. Thank too you. Late. Too early, too late. And just right. So iPod, we all have heard of it, right? Not because it's better, trust me. MP3 player existed three years before the iPod. But nobody ever heard of this, right? Because it was too early. Your heads back then, I don't know how old you guys were, maybe your parents. They could not conceive the Walkman's better, you know, like I said, you know. What is this? You know, it was too early for them to conceive the concept of having a digital music on, on my pocket. Later on, by 2001, computer was more accessible. Definitely, but, they thought that, but technologically, it was working. You could choose your music, you could pick your in the song, but it was too early because first, the musicians were not on board. You know, the whole concept of my music being on a digital format, so, it's like selling me a product which is empty. There's no music in it, for example. So yes, that, this was a perfect time for the iPod. Again, the Zoom came after the iPod, and it was a failure, as you said, uh, because it was too late, because the iPod was eating everybody alive, right? Everybody has an iPod, and you do like this. This quote was kind of cool, and you shuffle. You know, the company knows which Exactly, uh, this is what I'm saying. There's no magical formula. I'm gonna talk about some models. People have done research on this. You have some models that decide when is a good time, but there's no like formula. If there is a formula, everybody will do it, right? But it's a matter of you seeing what's out there and what the needs are. Again, what we taught you, subhanAllah. Innovation life cycle, you know, identify, be convinced that there is an opportunity. So when these guys, Diamond Rio, created this, did they see an opportunity? Maybe not, maybe they did not do value caution. They didn't see what's out there, what people need. They do design thinking. They sit with people and say, do you want a music? And they say, no, I don't want it now. Maybe later, you know? They sit with musicians. Say, what do you guys think about, you know? Because of this, they could not figure out the perfect time to enter the market. But that's a very good question. So let's see. The technology improvement cycle, this is nice. So what we saw there was a product life cycle. Now I'm going to show you some curves, some research. People have done research on this. Very nice. I'm going to show you some data um, about innovation life cycle. It's in terms of innovation, you know, and they've done R&D on this. So this is a nice, what does it look like? S. S. It's called the S curve, by the way. So the S, you can see, we start here with some kind of technology. It goes slowly, slowly, slowly. People accept it. It goes a bit fast. Then I go slowly, 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 and typically I'm mature enough. This is some trends. I'm not saying everything's like this, but there are a lot of trends like this, okay? So let me just show you some S curve. Um, this is another S curve, the thing we just saw now. So it's divided to, you could see them, in terms of adopters. So innovators, only a few people will like, you know, like when something comes out, so um, uh, wow, technology. For example, NFC chip. 
Maybe. How many people were using it initially? Yeah, no. The innovators. Yeah. Me and you and her. Not the, the people who are R&D, people who love technology. About 2%, 3%, right? The people will take the leap of faith, right? Yeah, let's go. I'm going to go and try it. And I want to try this. So that's the innovators here. And now, others will see the innovators and say, wow, you have to, what is this? So cool. Uh, 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 uh. We start having somebody called the early adopters, right? Those who are the first people who got an LED screen in their houses, the first people who has virtual reality headsets, right? VR headsets. You know, not many people. How many of you have VR headsets in their houses? Yeah. For gaming? For gaming. So three? Three? Okay. Maybe you are the early adopters. I had it before you, so I'm the innovator. Okay, I had it about five years ago. So, yeah, so because you want to explore them, you see, oh, VR came out, let me try this out, connect it to your computer, see what's going to happen, right? And then you have, after you guys will come with the VR, who will come? The early majority. Now people say, wow, VR is the future. We need one. My kid needs one. My brother needs one. Well, now that's why you saw the peak here, see? These are the majority now. These were adopters, but not many. Now we have the majority here, so that's early majority. And now we are at the peak, almost like a bell. So we're here, this is kind of the peak of the bell shape. If this was, what you see the blue thing is called the normal distribution. Yeah. You're a normal bell shape. You have a little bit here, a little bit here, and mostly in the middle. That's what we call it normal distribution. The S curve surpasses this, you can see, goes up here, and now we start having the late majority, still majority. So the early majority and late majority are half of the bell shape, you see? And then we have, we call those laggards, you know, the ones who want to kind of imitate and follow everybody else. Late covers, the train has yeah. passed them. And you can see percentage-wise, in the middle you have these 34% and 4% because you have 68% in the middle. That's the formula, if you know statistics, okay? We call this uh, the normal distribution. Very interesting, huh? Let me show you some curves if you don't believe me. These are trends. These are not something we came up with. Uh, you can see, you can see kind of a pattern of an S. You can see them, most of them. Like, sh sh oh, like sh yeah. these are actual data. They don't make these up. They put them in data analytics. So we got. You can see color TV, for example, happened to this. Um, uh, computers, clothes washer. You can see the clothes washer. Here, to S, you know, uh, dryer. A little bit uh, faster here at the beginning. Uh, refrigerator, stove, electricity, you can see electricity, you know, so many of these follow an S distribution in terms of innovation. Interesting, huh? You see, so it's based on actual research, people do not just come up with this. The S is it's great. Uh, the the no, no, it doesn't die, the finish, no, you see it's up all so the way. So these ones are up for these specific. No, if it goes down, it's not S anymore, that would be a different model, I shall show you, you have different models. Again, I'm not saying every single technology in the world follows this. We're saying there are different distributions, right? We have normal distribution, you have, again, different kind of uniform distribution and so on. S is one kind of distribution for innovation. Typically, it survives, yes. This is a S. Okay, so this is like S as well. You can see some S's here. Again, you can zoom into them and see what these are, but you can see the curves, right? The blue and red, they're almost uh, very similar to S. This is based on the Wall Street Journal. So another kind, of distribution is called, um, again, the hype cycle uh, curve. You can see the hype cycle, different than the S. Does not do the, the, the innovators, early adopters, uh, early majority, late majority, it doesn't do that. See how it goes? How does it go? Here? Boom, you know, like a nuclear bomb. Everybody takes it and then goes down towards the peak, goes up a little bit and stays here. Never goes up where it was there. You see? Interesting, huh? This is called the hype cycle. Hype, as the name sounds, hype. We're all hyped up about, I don't know, oh yeah, uh, Pokemon Go. Yeah, maybe, you, no, I think, no, I think this will apply to Pokemon Go. You know, initially, everybody's here, then died, and uh, some people still play it, you know, so, but not like this, maybe a year. But it does look something like this, right? Um, uh, 3D TVs. 3D TVs. Remember 3D TVs? Everybody wants to buy one. Everybody went to buy them. All my friends went and bought one. So it got a big, big time there. And then it died. It died completely. And then now some people, when you buy it, they say, oh, it has 3D. I'm like, okay, I'll take it. It's okay, you know? So it's still here, maybe even less. But sometimes it dies completely. That would be a different curve. Really? Completely? That no one manufactures them anymore. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we had a 3D team here, right? 3D. Yeah. yeah, where are they? Nobody's here? 
Yeah, 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 you guys are cheating, right? They didn't die? They don't make it anymore. Wow. So yeah, so, so maybe in that curve it's going to go like down and then go down again, you know? Interesting. Now it's all 3D projectors. Yeah. And it's very cheap. It's cheaper than the channels. Exactly, that's the problem. Again, back to the... Back to the very good point, you know, I love this innovation we talk about, the, very similar to your question, when to go to market, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe it was too early, yeah, there was no because there's no channels, there's no content. You have to have, I remember when we got it first time, we had to get a specific CD, the one you put in the shop. Yeah, yeah. You know, the one you go, oh, wow, you go home, like, what do we do now? There's nothing, there's no content, you know? You buy a Blu-ray, which is very expensive, just, just watch that movie. Actually. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I, I think this is a very good example for for too early. You know, going to market too early, TVs, I think now is too early. And I don't, as you guys said when you kind of came up with ideas, I don't, uh, uh, I don't think it's far away in the near future for 3D TV to come back in, and and the company will kind of lead, you know, and have something so unique in it without glasses and stuff like this that will change the whole 3D. But I think it's going to come back for sure. We all know that. We all say the future. Would be you're gonna watch a football game if you watch football or any sports like this. You all say that, and I know it's gonna it's happen. Really yeah, it's gonna be like this. You see when they're walking here, you see like a real, real field in front of you. You just sit in a chair and you watch the game here. Imagine how cool that you see the ball going and so on. So we all know that that's gonna happen. It's a matter of time, uh, but obviously again, it's, it cannot be too early because it might not be good quality. Back to the point. They only give me something semi, semi working. And I would kill the idea in my head and never could have succeeded anymore. Anyway, so this is the idea. So we said we have the innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority, and laggards. Again, there's something called the CHASM. They called it, they published a paper on this. So the CHASM is kind of the, the, the place where if you pass it, you pass this, you kind of go through this actual um, early majority, you know, the, the actual S curve. If you don't, you die. So it's kind of a moment where the company has to transform, hopefully, the early adopters later on to, to early majority, exactly. You have the early majority here, so that I go through this. We call this a chance in case we ask you the definition of it, okay? So it's kind of the link between transforming the early adopters. So it's very early in the early adopters, hopefully transforming them to early uh, majority, hence bypassing Kind of a hiccup. If I pass this, I pass the exam. You know, think about it as an exam question. Okay, for for companies. So first mover, fast follower, uh, food dragger, late entry. So again, also when you look at market entry, we said we have too early, too late, and just in time. Some people define them further. By the way, everything you see now are published in papers. Some people come up with these ideas and they publish them. So some people came up with this whole concept of too early, too late. Right? It's now it's First mover, be first to market. Fast follower, that's interesting, right? This is this is in terms of companies coming up with ideas. So as soon as you came up with an idea, I followed you so fast, right? Again, I gave you some examples of food on click and Uber and Kareem. And so they're fast followers, because now if you have Kareem number two or Muhammad Uber or something, right? That would be way too late, right? So it's not a fast follower. Yes, you copied them, but you're too late to copy. Uh, food dragger. Again, do everything to delay the growth of, of the market. So you're kind of lagging your food, you know, you're delaying um, adoption of the technology. So you're kind of delaying others. And late entry, obviously, wait for everybody else until I come in. So that's super late entry. These are kind of definitions for strategies for new products, okay? So going to market, uh, we're almost uh, getting towards the technicalities and so that I have some time to talk about the exam at the end. Project, okay, so so far so good. So innovations come in different cycles. You know, either you need to choose wisely how to go to the market, and they all follow a specific pattern. You can see either the S pattern, you know, or the typical life cycle of a product. You can see how the life cycle of the product is that goes up. Like you said, three D TV might come back. If it comes back, what, what graph would that be? Because now it's dead, right? Completely. Yeah, now it will come with a completely new innovation. It will not be maybe changing the anymore. So it yeah. will right? be start all over again. It's going to start the whole cycle all over again. So when we do, and this is very important, guys, um, when you do any innovation, 
when I bet it's here, we are at the last stage, the launch, the go to market. We want to go to market, right? So you have to do a plan for this. It's not technical anymore, you know, and this is where your final project pitch will come in. We'll talk about it a little bit now. Um, you need to do something called the business plan. You have to put the, the headset of not an engineer anymore, the headset of a businessman, okay? To do a businessman, to be a businessman or a woman, you have to come up with a business model. A business model basically Pay attention, very important for the final exam, and very important for life, to be honest. You know, I've done tons of business plans in my life, and I'm pretty sure you're going to end up doing one for you. And again, in the final project, I want to see it somewhere there, you know, the business model. The business model in plain English is how are you going to make money, okay? Are you going to rent it? Are you going to sell it? How much? Why? How much is it going to cost you? Who are your partners? How are you going to go to market? Who are your suppliers? You know, there are big titles here. You can see them here. What are the key activities? Who are the partners? You're going to partner with RTA. You're going to partner with DIWA, maybe, government. Why would they want to partner with you? Would they partner with Starbucks? Why do they want to partner with you? So you have to put them all in your business model. What are the resources that you need? Either human resources, physical resources, um, uh, office supply, you know, computers, material to make, actually make this. What is the cost structure? How much is it going to cost you? Right? Cost structure is going to be... 50 bucks, $10 for material, $5 for development, $5 for marketing, for example, you know, each item. Uh, what's your value proposition? Maybe that's the most important. Value proposition, what's your added value? What are the, the things that you have others don't have? You're going to have four, five, six of them, right? Typically, you already have done value quotient analysis, but in your business model, you're going to make be very clear what makes you so special. What's your added value? Does that make sense? Client relationships, again, how are you going to target clients? How are you going to talk to customers? You know, what you're going to do workshops, you're going to do conferences, how are you going to do focus groups? You know, what, what kind of relationship do you have with the client? I say, I'm going to do something for education. I'm a teacher. I have good links with students, you know, for example. Um, again, what, who are your clients? Very important. So customer segmentation. So is it between 18 and 22, male or female, educated, illiterate, you know, uh, culture, some kind of culture? You have to really be very clear who your market is and where. Is it UAE? Is it US? All these are part of client segments. Uh, distribution channels, how are you going to distribute your product? What's your plan? You know, you make it, you make 500 of them in China. How are you going to bring it them here? What's the, what's the process? You know, all these are there. And the last but not least is your revenue flow. You know, how are you going to basically cost me this, I'm going to sell it for this, you know, the profit will be at this. So what's your revenue and how? How are you going to make money? You know, again, as I said, are you going to rent it? Are you going to sell it? And, and do you have leases? Do you have money from insurance, money from, I don't know, uh, warranties, maintenance? All these could be part of this, okay? Anybody of you ever have done a business plan, like a whole business plan for anything? No? That's good. So this is super important. Let's watch a one-minute video or two-minute video. We're going to go to the boxes in a second to give an example. If you want, I can show you the boxes. So this is a very, if you want to remember one thing, you have to remember this. So again, you put your name here. For your final project, I need to see a business plan. It's one page, this template. Okay? And you fill these. I put the questions for you to see them. You can see them, the numbers. So uh, proposition, what's your value proposition? Uh, again, what's your customer's problems? How are you trying to solve it? What are your added value? How much you would, uh, how, how are you going to grow customers? Through what channels? Who is your most important customer? All these and again, the cost, how much is going to cost you? How much are you going to sell it? Okay, not number-wise, explanation-wise. You say, I'm going to sell, uh, I need 50 uh, 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 material. Each one costs me a dollar, it's $50. Yeah, uh, the cost structure would be here. Some of them would be fixed costs, some would be variable costs, right? Like office and rent and, and so on, and electricity bills if you have a, a company, and stuff like this. Does that make sense? So obviously this would be in your report, in your final report. What page? Your, we call this the business model canvas. There's a whole book on this, business model canvas. Let's watch a quick video on the canvas. I think this is a nice video. Maybe you should watch it at home as well. An organization's business model can be described with nine basic building blocks, your customer segments, your value proposition of great segments, the channels to reach customers, customer relationships you establish, the revenue streams you generate, the key resources and key activities you require to create value, the 
key partners, and the cost structure of the business model. But it's not sufficient to just enumerate the nine building blocks. What you really want to do is to map them out on a pre-structured canvas. This is what we call the business model canvas, the tool that helps you map, discuss, design, and invent new business models. Let's briefly go through the nine building blocks, starting with the customer segments. These are all the people and organizations for which you're creating value. This includes simple users and paying customers. For each segment, you have a specific value proposition. These are bundles of products and services that create value for your customers. Channels describe through which touch points you're interacting with customers and delivering value. Customer relationships outline the type of relationship you're establishing with your customers. The revenue streams make clear how and through which pricing mechanisms your business model is capturing value. Then you need to describe the infrastructure to create, deliver, and capture value. The key resources show which assets are indispensable in your business model. The key activities show which things you really need to be able to perform well. The key partners show who can help you leverage your business model. Since you work on all key resources yourself, how will you perform all key activities? Then once you understand your business model's infrastructure, you'll also have an idea of its cost structure. So with the business model canvas, you can map out your entire business model in one image. This works for startup entrepreneurs just as well as for the most senior executives. Okay, excellent. That's nice. Okay, so again, to summarize, we have nine major blocks. Okay, let me stop this. So let me interesting. Okay, so back to this. So we have nine, as you can see them. Again, maybe here's not very clear, but the canvas would be. So you have nine blocks, and again, any any company. This is for entrepreneurs. Okay, this is not for a product. We have a new company. Yes, this is very famous. It's called the business model canvas. Well, Has to be this four. Well. Exactly. You have the cost here. Remember, you could just download the canvas. It's an Excel sheet uh, online. You can find it in Doc or Excel. With the box is empty, so you could fill them, and you will have like a nice template for your report. Okay. And this is so important because when you go do a pitch or for investors, that's what they care about. See, what's your business structure? If you open this, you have everything, right? What's your added value? Right? How are you going to make money? How much is it going to cost me? Everything you could think of is here. Trust me. You open a company. Okay? And this is how we, we think about it. Again, obviously, you could put more business analytics here in the revenue. You say expected to make $2 million in five years. We're going to break even in two years. You could put all the details here. Again, because this co co constitutes all the building blocks for your company. Okay? Are we good with the business plan? Business plan will be uh, like a chapter for each one of these. This is a canvas. You know, this would be typically at the end, yes. For me, all I care about is this. And most people don't even read the documentation if you have like a big, but yes, because the business plan is going to have like uh, more stuff. Like, uh, going to have mantra, the mantra of your company, you know, like mantra, your slogan, um, uh, your vision. Um, and customer segmentation detail, like pie charts, analysis, interview, you know, like everything we know we do, we're going to put them there. This should be summarizing. For example, here in customer segments, you're going to say we'll be targeting high school students between 18 and 21. According to stats, uh, we have 2 million students, you know, in, in the MENA region. 1% uh, will be targeted. For example, that's it. In the actual chapter, you're going to go details. Like analysis, say on Dubai, you have this, it's cool, and so on. Okay, but good question, yes. So the business plan, this is not a business plan, this is a business model canvas. This is only one piece of the business plan. Okay, so um, I think we are officially done with everything I need to talk about today. Yes, I am. So that was a long lecture today. Thank you for bearing with us, yes? Yes, um, that's a separate thing. Um, so, be quick. Uh, again, I, I, I could talk about it without the lecture, and I'll show you how to actually search for patents. So, again, obviously, patents, you have different kinds of patents. Um, 
there is a small lecture I upload. I have a quick look at it. Um, again, it's not going to come to the final exam. Don't worry. It's for your own information only. So obviously, you could patent um, different stuff. Not everything is patentable, like software is not patented. So if I come up with an app, I can patent it. Um, yes, you only patent products with designs. You should have a fully fledged design. Um, it's not easy because patents are country specific. So if you have an idea, you have to patent in every country. Uh, it's not like all, all over the world, no. US, Europe, UAE, every country have their own patent uh, rules. Um, it's very tedious, it costs money. You need an attorney, an IP attorney, IP meaning intellectual property. Um, and the first part of patenting is actually seeing what's out there. That's the most difficult, we call it patent search. So we're gonna do it together now, I'll give you an example. Um, and the idea is you see if what you're claiming, a big part of any patent is claims, claim one, claim two, claim three. So if you're gonna come up with any patent, inshallah, one day, first thing you're gonna sit down is what are you claiming that you have done and nobody else has done? We call them claims. So if you're gonna read any patent online, the first section you're gonna open is claims. What do they claim? And see, uh, this is what they have done, okay? Then let's do, lucky us, we live in a generation of digital data. So before, back in the days, the only way we look for patents, I think back in my days even, I'm not that old, but we did not have Google patents. We had something called USPTO, United States Patent Office. You need know, subscription, you have to be in America and so on. Now Google patents is there, very easy. You go Google patents. The nice thing, what I like about Google patents uh, or patents, uh, what I like about it is, is the interface is Google. We all love Google, right? Yeah. So does it give you a headache with a lot of stuff? No, write anything you want. It's gonna give you all the patents in the world under Google, uh, patent, China, Japan, any country. So again, let me give you an example. Uh, interactive desk, right? So your company put interactive uh, desk. No, so yeah, interactive desk is fine. Um, again, the only two, two, two keywords here. So interactive desk is space system for automatically adjusting pad and zoom. This is grand, look at the number, wow, 606712. So this is the, by the way, this is the number of patents. The number represents how many patents were patented up till then. Keeps on going up. So you imagine yeah. how many patents you have, I cannot see well, I'm tired. How, what is that? Zero, Without the A, remove the A, so three digits. Six million, huh? Yes, yeah, six million patents. <laughs> six million, you know how many made it to the market? Less than 1%, less than 1%. You know, there's patent. Idea, patent, idea, patent. Because when you patent, you don't, have, you don't have to actually invent it. Just an idea, you draw it. All they care about, what do they care about in the patent office? No. No, they don't care about this. Either. All they care about is what you said. That, that already exists. That's it. It could be batata, you could be crazy and say, I'll do a flying train inside a flying house with a, with a mermaid. You know, that's my design. And you know, good for you, pay me money. You know, you're the first one to say this. They don't care because you could be batata. Oh, they, they don't, they're not engineers. They don't know what you're talking about even. All they care about is, let me check what's out there. Nobody said what you said. Good for you, you know? So that's why obviously when you patent, it has to be something that you're going to make. Otherwise, why do you want to waste your time with patent? The good news now, um, in the US, which is the most biggest market for patents in the world, um, they have something called now a provisional patent. Because patent costs too much money and takes too much time, and you need an attorney, and something that takes four or five years at least. They came up with a very cool way, it's called a provisional patent. It costs you maybe, I think, uh, $200, $300, but not that but the good thing about it is it protects you only for one year. Thank you. Gives you time to find investors. Gives you time to decide people would like this thing or not. Once you, uh, you figure this out, after one year, you have to submit a full patent or it will die. You cannot, you cannot keep up with you. Again. They give you one year to do it, which makes sense. I like the idea. I've done a number of provisional patents myself, and some of them I decided to submit a full, some I killed. Which is fine, I think it's a good idea, just throw $200 and you protect yourself for one year. And in this year, if anybody stole your idea, you always have the, the time you submitted the patent. You don't get the patent, there's a submission time. So you could take it to court, say I submitted it on this day and you used it on this day, so obviously you stole it from me. So you have some evidence that says uh, you That's actually fine. did this. So it's a good idea, I recommend it, provisional patent, check it out. Application form is super easy for the provisional. It's like two pages, three pages. 
put the idea, put like some pictures just for you to have some kind of back door in case, subhanAllah, your idea, somebody stole it and made tons of money, you always could go back and say, I have and many, many lawsuits happen for this, okay? Well, as soon as you submit, it becomes patent pending. You know, like you have a lot of people say patent pending in their CV, which is nothing. It doesn't mean anything. It means you submitted it. Any joker can submit the patent, you know? So, and usually it takes about three to four years in the US. In the UAE, three to four months, okay? Uh, no, no, here I think maybe one year, less than one year you get the patent, because not many. You know, why, why does it take time? Because you have a lot of applications. Yeah. Look at this, you have six million. I mean, you don't have manpower. The patent office, there are five people working, you know? So obviously that's why it takes a lot of time, about years. Here, uh, again, as I said, I don't, maybe five, six patents come per year maximum. So you'd be, if you submit, you'd be one of five people in the country. Yeah, because nobody wants to submit here. Submit in the US or submit in, in Europe. It protects you here only. I could go to Lebanon and I use your thing, you cannot sue me. You only have a patent in the UAE. Yes, you have to choose them. You submit it again and again and again and again. And each one has a different form. Each one has different rules. You might get the patent here. I might not get it in China. You know, yes. Uh, so, so yes, so that's the idea. Okay. So submission of the patent is very easy, as I said, uh, the first stage. But the difficult part is the patent search. You can see what we just did now. Uh, let me just finish this quick. So we did a quick patent search. Obviously, this is not a professional. And uh, the companies that you hire is if you're going to do a patent, there is a lawyer. He will do this in a very professional way, put like everything, not like a quick Google, you know. But but this is a quick way for you to see, have an idea about what you're doing. You can see again, this is 1996, huh? Look how old this interactive 1996. So you are 20 years late, for example, you know. And, and again, you say, oh, it's not the same, and so on. How do we know we open the patent? We can go inside it. Again, I just googled nothing here. But let me just have a quick look at it. You see some some sketch. You can see interactive desktop. You can see they have they have the design. You can see the design here. You can see the lights and the interactive and so on. You see it? It's nice, huh? It's different than interactive. Something else. It could be something else. How do you know? We don't. We don't gonna see the picture. We're gonna look at what? What did I say? Thank you. What is claimed? This is what you care about. This is what they're claiming. That's all you care about. So the interactive desktop system comprising of an image capture system for capturing an image in the field of view. Obviously, this is not what you guys are talking about. Oh, you get an idea. Then you make an Excel sheet. You put the patent number, what you found, what the claims are, so that you can use it in the appendix of your report. You say, I found seven patents. These are what they claim. It's very important. Again, also, in your final project, huh, I need to see this. I need to see a table of all, not all, maybe seven, eight, 10 patents that are similar to yours and what makes you different. That shows credibility. You can't say, I couldn't find anything. I'm like, are you kidding me? Couldn't find anything, you know, anything on, on scanning and NFC. Again, by the way, um, a service is not patented, so you won't see patents, but you have to look at the device itself. Yeah, using the service. What, what machines are out there that allow you to take points in a grocery or a coffee or, and so on and so on. Okay, so, and again, if you see the actual patent itself, it put all the details, and, and it also put... Uh, you can steal it even, Doctor, and you Definitely, I highly recommend, if not steal it, but I highly, steal is a big word. Okay, um, no, but yes, of course you can. That's what I think you should do. If you think that you're doing something and you find somebody who did it, start with their design, see, put their design, Start with it and start deleting from it. And it tried, you will have a very professional design. Obviously, you will have your own. Because everything is a table. I mean, what did they have? A lamp and a table. And, you know, the, the uniqueness is the claims. But in terms of design, if you're not a good designer, I highly recommend using these. You see, I mean, these are done by professionals. When we patent, like when I patented, we hire a professional. Comes and sits and he talks and he draws and he does it and put it on a computer. And you know, it's not only 3D. Now you could put 3D models as well. Before it was only 2D. But now most patents will have a 3D design as well inside. Just to avoid, and they try to put all the details possible to avoid lawsuits, you know? The more you put, the more you avoid. Because the more you say, ah, oh, claim number 15, like in a court. Ah, oh, yeah, claim number 15. And you don't make it specific. You don't say, this works on Microsoft. No, you make it generic. 
works on Mac, Apple, you know, like for example. Uh, so that tomorrow you say, oh, you said Microsoft, we did it in Mac, for example. They always try to find loopholes. That's why you need an attorney that will read it and try to avoid um, putting something that's wrong or forget to put something. Okay? And so what period does it really Depends, depends. 10 to 20 years, depending on the country. Mm -hmm. Yes? 20, 20 years it dies. Anybody can use it. Yeah, after 20 years, the patent, when the patent dies, anybody could go and invent something. But the odds are, go back to the, divorce, the, the life cycle. You are at maturity, and not even maturity, sometimes you're going down. That's why they say 20 years is enough. You don't own ideas. It's virtual. That's why I say, give you 20 years, enjoy. After 20 years, he'll uh, give, give it to the people. Okay? And some people, you can see, this is a very good point. Some people don't do patents, like Pepsi, right? Pepsi never patented their 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 their, their mixture of Pepsi. It's not patented. Why? Yeah, I know, but yeah, but but and now anybody could steal it, right? You know, this is what everybody says. I mean, how clever are they, right? So imagine how many years. They, if I know the ingredients, I could open a Pepsi, me and you, right? They cannot sue us because they don't have a patent. It's kind of a, a, a sword with two sides, right? If you patent, you protect yourself, but you make it public. Because I have to see it. If you don't patent, make it secret. But how long can you keep it a secret? One employee, that's a bad employee, that tries to USB copy it, many people can have it and they cannot open their mouth. They cannot say anything, you know? I'm just saying, So it's, some people decide to go this way. Again, same thing with Windows. Okay? Microsoft Windows, the Windows itself. The code is not, uh, it's not, no. That's why they claim that Bill Gates stole the code and so on. That's what they said, right? Mm -hmm. But nobody knows because the code, we don't have it. Nobody has a code of it. Sometimes they, 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 they showed some pieces of the code and said this was copied. But nobody knows what it is. So it's not patented. So yes, you can make your own windows, exact copy, and they cannot open their mouth, you know, if you have the code. Okay, any questions? Are we good with patent? The last thing is elevator pitch. Um, so elevator pitch, each one of you will have every team, let's agree on the final project. So we have a video. Video is a commercial of your product, okay? So a uh, video uh, between one to two minutes maximum. So I'm going to start on the camera so that it should be official, so we don't change. So between one to two minutes, I think one and a half is more than enough. It's a commercial. You know what a commercial is? Commercial, as if I'm watching on TV, you're like, oh... Ariel, you know, my clothes is dirty, chocolate, you know, I, I come here, I open, ta-ta-ta, Ariel, you know Ariel for, for clothes, because <laughs> you talk about laundry, and then the, the, the mom would come with her son, say, oh, okay, son, something like this, and then that's half of it, or let's say 30 seconds maximum, the other part would be the technicalities, like you talking about the features of your product. If you have a tweet design, say, we decided to use this feature and we added sensor here and you show us the model 2D or 3D, whatever it is, or the real thing if you have something close to it. This is a video. Here's no presentation. That's it. We're going to play the video and then you have a one minute pitch to go. Yeah, the whole team, one of you, 60 seconds to actually tell us about your project in 60 seconds. And what do you have in the pitch? The pitch will start with the hook. Hook. Okay? What is a hook? Hook is basically grabbing our attentions. Okay? So you start as a, have you ever, um, have, you, uh, have you ever, um, have you ever used your phone inside an elevator and, and there was no signal? It was like, oh, yeah, yeah, we have, there's no signal elevator. We have a solution. We have designed, da, 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 da. you know, you always grab our attention or, um, do you want to make a million dollars in two days? Oh yeah, of course we want to make, we have, you know, so you always start with something, everybody wakes up, you know, not like, hi, my name is Muhammad and Ahmad and Hassan, that's 30 seconds, you know, okay, because I'm going to time you, and when it beeps, I'm not going to let you say a single word after that. Does that make sense? So you have the video that gives us a story, typically after your pitch, so you could use the video for after your pitch. In your pitch, you're going to tell me maybe three things. What is the key valuable added values? You could take it from the business uh, canvas. What's your value proposition? What's the problem? That's the first thing, by the way. The problem, which it comes with the hook, is what do you think? So the problem, your solution and values, 
business model. Business model summary. Okay? So it's going to cost us this. We're going to set for this. And our market is 2 million kids living in Africa, example. So that gives us an idea how big my market is. Does that make sense? All this in one minute. So you cannot stutter. You cannot move. You think about uh, what's cooking because you have 60 seconds and the clock is ticking, you know? And at the end, that would be at least 20% of your grade, the pitch. Because if you don't say it in the pitch, it's too late, my friend. I still have the report, I can read it, but on the pitch, you kind of fail if you did not deliver the whole message, okay? No, 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 pitches don't have slides. Only talking, okay? So let me just uh, give you an example of a quick pitch here. I have the, these guys are good. Coffee Jewels, Coffee Jewels. G? G, J, I mean, sorry, J, J, U, L, E, S. Yeah, I think Coffee Jewels. Yes, Shut up. That's it. Coffee Jewels, I like it. Your pitch. Let's give you an idea. <laughs> Coffee is never the right temperature. It's served around 180 degrees Fahrenheit. If I were going to pour a glass of this for myself and take a sip, I'd burn my tongue and not go to taste anything for the rest of the day. So what do I need to do? I'm going to wait around for it to cool, and finally, eventually, it will be perfect for like that much time. Before I know it, it's too cold, and I'm pouring it down the drain. Coffee Julie's solves both of these problems. First, they absorb extra heat from your coffee and make it a drinkable temperature within minutes. And then, they release the heat that they store and keep it in the perfect drinking range for up to twice as long. Our favorite way to use Coffee Julie's is in this vacuum insulated travel mug. In here, you can pour your coffee as hot as you want, and it'll be the perfect drinking temperature in five minutes, and it'll stay that way for over five hours. We have five perfection packs here for you to try out with coffee that we poured over three hours ago. Nice. How long was that? Coffee. You see, 57 seconds down. So it tells the whole story. They thought it was interesting, very clear. We understood everything. They even had the actual prototype, which you will have when you're doing the pitch. Was that, would that be considered a prototype? No, they had the beans. Yeah, so that's not a prototype, right? That's not a prototype. Uh, in this case, yeah. it's a fine prototype because they're getting money, yeah. But in our case, it would be a prototype, it's fine. Um, it's very clear, very interesting, very confident. I love they have a brand. Obviously, these are ahead of you guys. Well, these are students, huh? And they made millions out of this. Super. I told you about this, right? Yeah. The idea. Um, so the idea is, uh, it's good to have a brand, like a logo, a poster, like a brand, a marketing brand. You know. So if he's standing there, it'd be nice to have your company vision. You know, like we have a logo and a slogan, and again, shows professionalism. The more you give me. The more you give me, the more, what? You, <laughs> the more you get. Exactly. It's, it's, it's a two-way thing. If you come here and say, um, A4 paper, and you have like your name, and you put it on the front, I'm like, oh my God, you're a professional, you know? I mean, this is innovation entrepreneurship. If you don't look like an innovator, you don't act like one, uh, then basically I'm going to give you a bad grade. So so this is the idea. It's not only about your idea. It's about how the way you present it. It's not these guys. You see, again, I like how they started that. What did they start with? Do you still remember what they started with? Coffee? Yeah, or coffee is never at the right temperature. He started with that. That's a hook, no? But if I told you coffee is never at the right temperature, you're telling me there is a solution. You got, already got a solution, which totally makes sense. It's too hot or too cold. We have a solution. So you, the thing about the pitch, you don't want to explain too much. It has to be seamless. It has to be a story. Oh, coffee is never at the right temperature. We have a solution. Put this bowl inside. It's sucks energy, gives back energy, you have a perfect solution, we have a prototype, you want to try some coffee, thank you guys. And obviously, if they had maybe 10 or 20 seconds more, they would have talked about the business model, which they will do after. I mean, this is only a piece of it. They would have like a discussion, how much does it cost you, where are you going to sell it? So it would be nice to kind of include it in the pitch as well. Okay, and again, you can do two, like they did, 30 seconds each, almost. It would be nice, because it's a bit boring, what we'd be talking all the time, like pass, because because you need to memorize it. Yeah. Pitches, you don't you don't improvise. Nobody improvises in a pitch. If you think you're gonna improvise, trust me, you will fail. You don't improvise, you memorize. And you time yourself exactly at 58. You don't finish at 40, you don't finish at 45. 
means you're insulting your audience, meaning you don't want more time. You have nothing to say. That's what it means. People will use 59.9 seconds. This is the perfect. But I gave you 60, use 60. Why are you giving 40? Tell me more information. Okay? Does that make sense? Are we good with the pitch? So we have the pitch, one minute. The video, one to two minutes. And that's it. And Q&A, to be me and you. Asking, playing with your prototype, talking, you know? That's 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 variable, variable time. Fixed time is three minutes. And the report, of course, I'm gonna take it to break. We'll be uploaded online, no? Everything we taught you in this course. Everything we taught you. SAT, job to be done analysis, value quotient analysis, nine windows. I could keep on going, customer scenarios, design thinking, empathy, everything we've taught you should be there. Why did we teach you? Now, would I go and say, check them one by one? I wouldn't. If I don't see most of the important stuff, I would be not happy. I would subtract from everything missing, these five marks. Okay? No PowerPoint, no, 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 no presentation. That's it, you come here, your team could be behind you, one of you talking or two of you talking, with time into, because as soon as you start, I'm gonna start the timer, 60, peep, 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 you, no offense, you will shut up, okay? <laughs> okay, so it's not other record, no, but you won't say anything after that, tell us, it's over. Thank you, I say thank you. I will give you a grade on the pitch. That's about 20% of your grade. Now, Q&A, we start asking. And the bad news, if I ask a lot of questions, means what? Thank you so much. It means you did not tell me enough, you failed. I mean, you would already know your grade on the pitch if I asked about them, you know say, But you should kind of nail the, the key points of the pitch. Oh, you got all of them? Yeah, no, let's play with the prototype. Obviously, you're not going to tell me, I'm going to use a 50 kilo joule um, mega output. No, no, of course, you don't want to go technical, you know? You want to make it simple, easy, and value is all about your pitch. I mean, what's your added value? Focus on that part a lot, you know? Existing solutions have nothing compared to what we have in terms of A, B, C. This is what I want to focus on. I want to hear this from your mouth. What's you? Because I'm going to hold it against you, right? Because you're going to tell me I'm the first one to do this, right? Like, are you the first one? One second. Uh, what is this? Oh, we don't, we don't know about this. You don't know about this? That's bad. That's that's by itself bad. Remember, you say you cannot find everything online. I totally agree. But if I find something in two minutes that you don't know about, that's a disaster. Meaning you, you haven't done any homework, any research whatsoever, right? We've done a lot of presentations in this course. Remember it? You cannot, you cannot patent it here. Yeah, you can use it here up till they find out, until they find out and they come and patent it here. Yeah, you cannot patent it. If it's patented in a different country, you cannot patent it in another country, but you can use it in another country. Yeah, when you try to patent, they would see that it's patented somewhere else. They won't give you the patent, but you can use it. They cannot sue you until they come. They, if they, like if you make a lot of money, Wow, there's money here. We come to this country, so you're dead. You know, <laughs> that's why people won't go that way. You know, that's why they don't steal ideas like Samsung and Microsoft and Apple. They don't have time to steal. Some people say they stole my idea. Microsoft doesn't have time to steal ideas. You know, one phone call. How much you want? Five million. Five million. Give it to me. Hello's. It's theirs. You know, they don't care about stealing ideas of 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 like like people like us. You know, it's not worth it for them. To go to the attorney. The court fees will cost them more than, than five million, you know? Okay? Any question about pitch, patents, everything we talked about today? We talked about a whole bunch of stuff, like key points, you know, that you need to remember. The PowerPoint for today is uploaded on Moodle by itself, not with the zip folder. So if I were you, um, after the chapter on uh, job scoping, you know, that was the last chapter we covered. Ignore all the chapters after this, focus on today, because today is a combination of all the others. All I put them all together in 100 slides, okay? That's fine. So final exam, what's about the final exam? Let's talk about the final exam, guys. I will finish up today. Um, what time is it? 8.40? 8.35. Okay, give me a second. Let me go, yeah. but can you, can you turn off the video? For this part. Yeah. Yeah.